Um, <clears throat> my dad, uh, he was a simple guy. He wasn't um, philosophical. When you talked with him, he didn't come across an intellectual. He just was a normal, everyday kind of guy. He never went to college. He had no degrees. Uh, he wasn't preachy. He didn't talk Christian needs. He was just himself, Norm, or as many knew him by his nickname, Slim. I guess that's what you get for being six foot two and slender. So, or six foot five. Sorry. <laughs> I had the privilege of being able to golf with him and some of his buddies from work after uh, after I was uh, um, okayed by him. Told me that if I wanted to golf with him, I had to shoot 120 or less than on my first outing. So at 12 years old, I was out in the backyard in the field practicing my shots and chipping. And, and finally, I got to go with him, and I was so disappointed because I got 121. Oh. And he looked at me and goes, All right, I'll give you some grace there, son. So he let me start to golf with him and his buddies from work. He worked at Prudential Insurance at the time. And um, from what I saw, they liked and respected my father. Uh, he was their friend, and they knew it. Um, but so often, I can, I can remember one of them um, cursing as we golfed. And uh, next thing I knew, they were apologizing to my dad. And my dad rarely said a word to them, but they often apologized. And uh, it didn't really matter who you were. My dad was always my dad. He was always one. He didn't put any kind of front. I never saw him put on an act. He was always just the same. And I also had the privilege of working at Prudential. After he had retired for several years and I finally graduated college. My parents moved down south, but my dad was able to get me into Prudential. I didn't last too long, only six months, and I quickly went back to construction. But uh, while I was there, I was studying for the insurance exam. So at the time, I was living with a buddy of mine, renting a room from him. And um, when I would come down to Jersey from New York, um, I had nothing to rush home to get to. And the church that I had started attending was down in, in, in Crestman, New Jersey. So uh, most of my time was spent down there, but I would spend long hours at the office um, at night studying. And uh, again, I was, a, I was a new Christian at this time. Uh, Christ was, was it, not, it's not that Christ was new to me, because I, I knew about Jesus my whole life. But I didn't surrender him, to him until I was 22, and that's when everything changed dramatically. And as I was in the office one night, I was consumed with studying. Um, I remember having a long, intimate conversation with Eddie, one of my dad's friends that I had golfed with previously, and that he still worked there. And as Eddie and I talked long into the night, uh, Eddie said something to me in our conversation that I never forgot. He looked at me and said, Dave, because I've met a lot of Christians, but your dad is the real first one I ever met. And I remember asking why. And he said, because he walked the same way he talked and still wanted to be my friend. He was an ordinary God who followed an extra, uh, an ordinary guy who followed an extraordinary guy. That was my dad. And today we're going to continue this, this series that I started on these 12 disciples, these 12 ordinary men who decided to follow Jesus. This guy named John Max, uh, uh, MacArthur, he wrote a book called 12 Ordinary Men. He gives a lot of great insights in that. Um, now, my dad's friend, Eddie, was a down-to-earth, regular guy. Um, but do you ever wonder how to reach some of the skeptics in our world? These are the ones who say they don't believe in absolute truth. 
They say that they believe there are many paths to God and heaven. I had someone once say to me and put me on the spot as I was talking to them about God. And they said, are you telling me, Dave, that all these sincere people honestly and consistently believe in a God other than Jesus and are good, moral, loving people that God is going to send them to hell? Ever feel like reaching people like this is just beyond your abilities? And they're going to need someone really more intellectual than you to talk to. But I've learned God is just looking for ordinary men and women who serve Him. I remember my dad saying to me once, and I was a pastor at that point, and we were talking about some aspect of the Bible, and uh, it was a little intellectual, and he put himself down in front of me, um, thinking he wasn't intellectual enough to be in the conversation. I remember getting mad at him, and I, I, I told him at that point about my conversation with Eddie, uh, that he was more of an influence to other people than he could ever imagine. And sometimes because we think that way, that we're not smart enough, we might refrain from talking about Jesus to certain people. Now, if that's the case, what do we do with 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16? Let me read it to you. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. That's the NIV. Here's the uh, uh, New Living Translation. It says it just a slightly different. <clears throat> Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle, respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Now notice it says, We. <clears throat> meaning all of us should be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So when God sends a seeker to our doorstep, we need to be ready to witness to them. And when I say witness, I'm not saying get all spiritual on them. Do exactly what Amanda just did with us. This is who I am. This is what I'm about. This is what Jesus did in my life. That's your story. That's not anyone else's story. That's your personal story. And no one can say you're wrong. It's because it's yours. And if he sends a skeptic to our doorstep, we need to be ready to boldly tell them about our relationship with Jesus Christ. Because, and here's the truth, I ask you, after all, what skeptic would ever approach someone to ask about Jesus unless they did not first see Christ's words lived out in that person's daily life? They're coming to you because they saw it first. And they want to know why that makes you take it. That's a platform to share. We're told that we all have a person, that all of us who have a personal relationship with Christ are his ambassadors. We're his royal priests. Whether we want it or not, that's the camp we've fallen into. And he says that I've given you the power to witness to everybody. Whether it be a seeker or whether it be a skeptic. Whoever God sends our way, he's given us the power to talk to them about him. So, back to Philip, because that's who we're supposed to be talking about. 
So let me give you a little background and fill up the disciple. Or as some say, fill up the apostle. Those might go with me. Uh, what little that can be known about Philip comes mostly from the Gospel of John. And Philip is a Greek name. It means lover of horses. I don't know if he did. Um, but his, his Jewish name is not really known. Philip's genealogy, for instance, is not given anywhere in the Bible or historically. Like Kind of like Andrew and Peter, Philip was, uh, was a little bit different in, as far as the historical record. But Philip was from the town of Bethesda. And that's where Andrew and Peter were from, uh, where all of them probably attended the same synagogue. Uh, and there's good reason to think that Philip might have likely been a local fisherman, a professional fisherman, along with Nathaniel <coughs> Thomas and the other four apostles, Andrew and uh, Peter and James and John. We all know that they fished together, had probably a business together. Philip is, his name is listed in fifth place in each of the lists of the apostles. Matthew 10, Mark 3, Luke 6. The disciple or apostle Philip is not to be confused with another Philip in the Bible. Um, and we often do get him confused. And this is a Philip that was one of the seven deacons chosen in the early church in Acts chapter 6. You might remember one of the other deacons that was chosen, a guy named Stephen, who became the first martyr. Okay, there are four Philips mentioned in the Bible. Two were Herod's sons, probably not Christ followers, and two others are named Philip the disciple and Philip, we call Philip the evangelist. Uh, he's the one we read about, we read about in the book of Acts. Now people often, often confuse that Philip the evangelist with Philip the disciple. Um, but they're different guys. Philip the disciple is in John. Philip the evangelist is who we see in the book of Acts. Philip, remember, he spoke with the Ethiopian uh, and led him to Christ. He had four daughters that were um, really close to the Lord and prophetesses. Um, that's Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven deacons. Um, Philip the disciple was just mentioned once in the very beginning of the book of Acts. Philip most likely settled in Heropolis, uh, a city in the Roman province in Asia, and most likely he died there. Tradition tells us that he died like meant for most of the other disciples as a martyr for Jesus Christ. Um, and what about his calling, his leadership style? The day after Jesus called Andrew, John, and Peter, Jesus found Philip. And he told him in John 1 to 43, he said, follow me. And since Philip's calling took place near Bethany, beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing, John the Baptist, we're talking about, and we find that in John chapter 1, verse 28, it's likely that Philip was one of John the Baptist's disciples. And he was one who was seeking, in John 1.45, the one Moses wrote, wrote about in the law. Philip was actively seeking. Amanda talked about that, seeking. He didn't actually know who he was seeking, but he was seeking this man that John the Baptist was talking about. And he not only dropped everything to follow Jesus, because again, his seeking heart had finally found who he was after. But he also showed that he had a heart of an evangelist. Now, being an evangelist is really a messed up term today. Being an evangelist basically means you're somebody who goes out and shares the good news of Jesus Christ with others. A lot of times we look at and think of an evangelist and we just think of TV and these guys that are up there and... and we think of that as an evangelist. No. An evangelist is somebody who is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And so Philip, the first, one of the first things he did, he goes to his good friend Nathaniel. And he says, we found the Messiah. And from Philip's calling in John 1, verses 43 to, 40, uh, to 51, 
Uh, we see the feeding of the 5,000 in John 6, the visit of the Greeks, and, and in John 14, he's in the upper room. Philip was a process-oriented, by-the-book, practically-minded kind of guy. And he was kind of obsessed with identifying the reasons things can't be done. So he often overlooked the miraculous. And while Philip started out as a pragmatic, maybe even a cynic, he later matured in his faith and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're told that multitudes came to know Christ under his preaching. So let's examine each of these Philip stories, because we don't know a whole lot about them, so let's take what we do know and learn some lessons from them. Philip's calling, lesson one. John chapter 1, verses 43 to 51 is where it's found. <clears throat> and this lesson is sharing your faith with your friends. On his way to Galilee, Jesus meets Philip and he says, follow me. Philip then went and found his friend Nathaniel. We just went through that. And he said, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, was indeed this Messiah that the law was speaking about, that John was talking about. <clears throat> Nathaniel, he was overjoyed and jumped up and down. Oh. Nathaniel, I think he was more skeptical than Philip. Nathaniel was skeptical. Since Nazareth was not mentioned in the Old Testament, in the Talmud, in the Midrash, or in any contemporary pagan writings, why would the Messiah be born in such an insignificant place? Made no sense to Nathaniel. Not even people in the synagogues of Capernaum. We see this in John 6. Or Nazareth. We see that in Mark 6. They believe, none of them believed that it was possible that anything good could come from Nazareth. So in response to Nathaniel's skepticism, Philip chose not to try and win over his friend by argument, but instead took him to see Jesus. I wonder if he got that from Andrew. And when Jesus said to Nathaniel, uh, he said, here's a guy, a person without the seat when he first met, met him. And, 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 and what he meant by that word, by a person without the seat, is here is an Israelite in whom there's nothing false. And Nathaniel asked Jesus how he knew him. Obviously, Daniel thought that was true about himself as well. And Jesus said, well, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, some scholars say that's a reference to Hosea chapter 9 in the Old Testament, but most likely a reference to a time when Daniel was in prayer, maybe reading the word, maybe seeking God. And so Jesus had the supernatural knowledge of Nathaniel, and that broke down his skepticism right there on the spot. And Nathaniel immediately acknowledged Jesus as both the Son of God and the King of Israel. And Jesus finished his conversation by promising, Nathaniel, you think that's important? You're going to see all kinds of things. He was promising Nathaniel a vision of what could be and what was. And Jesus was the link by which those realities of heaven are going to come down to earth. And it was letting the thing that he's going to see it all. And we live in a culture that no longer believes in absolute truth. And it's very hostile toward organized religion. You don't buy into that. You don't read the paper. You don't read the news. <clears throat> All you got to do is go on, uh, go on the internet and say the latest news, and you go through that. And I guarantee every day you're going to see something about stones being thrown at religion, at Christianity. We're going to see that there's no absolute truth. In fact, did you know that the amount of different sexes is Huge. 
I mean, I went to get some medicine and I had to fill up something. And they said, male, female. And then they had about 10 others that I had no clue what they were talking about. I thought we just had a male and female. We live in a very different world, and there's no absolute truth, and they're, orga they're, they're hostile toward organized religion, and we read, again, almost every day. And then we read about these big, famous evangelists embezzling uh, money, or these famous pastors having sexual relations with other people in their church, or priests having relationships with boys. And I get why some people are skeptical of Christianity with newspaper headlines like that. Living in the global age of social media and internet has helped, but it's also hurt the cause of Christ. So, how do you reach a highly skeptical, diverse, believing person? The same way that Nathaniel was reached through the witness of a friend who not only knows the word but puts it into action every day. James chapter 1. And until the skeptic can experience the gospel's true meaning through the witness of a genuine believer who walks what he or she confesses, they are unlikely to give up the way that they have been living their whole lives. We need to make them thirsty for Jesus. And the way they're going to become thirsty for Jesus is by seeing something that they desire. Something that they don't have. Now what about the feeding of the 5,000? That's lesson number two. And it's found in John chapter 6, one, verses 1 to 14. <clears throat> and this is seen with heavenly eyes. When Jesus crossed the far shore of the Sea of Galilee in John chapter 6, it tells us there was a great crowd that followed him, and because they saw him heal the sick and do all these miracles. Now, the size of the crowd, and I've said, talked about this before, they say it was about 5,000 men and women, uh, uh, 5,000 men that were served. So when you include women and children, there was probably upwards of 20,000 people. And when Jesus saw the crowd coming toward him, he, he tested Philip. Again, last week I talked about it. Why did he say something to Philip and not the other disciples? He tested Philip and said, where, where, where are we going to buy bread for all these people? Now, Philip was a native of Bethesda, and some think that he was most likely the kind of administrator of the group in charge of meals and logistics and stuff like that. And he responded by saying to Jesus, that to feed this many people, it's going to be impossible, not even 200 denier worth of bread and eight months worth of wages is not even enough to give every person a single bite. And it's at this point that the Apostle Andrew brought a little boy with five barley loaves and two small fish. And Jesus told the disciples to get the people seated on the grass. He gave thanks for the food. And with that boy's small lunch, he fed them all until they ate as much as they wanted. Now let's understand, this was no snack meal. This was a feast. Twelve baskets of food were left over, and it says that people ate as much as they wanted until they were full. Snacks don't do that. And in light of this miracle, Jesus said Jesus withdrew from the people. Some say it was because they began to see him as a prophet and they desired by force to take him and be their king and lead them against the Roman government. Might be that's why he withdrew. Um, but ah, I know that after John chapter 6, verse 15, then came John chapter 6, verse 16 to 21. So, I think Jesus just wanted to freak the disciples out and walk out of the way. I think he was just playing a prank. I don't want to hear those words. Come on, guys, wasn't that funny? But we know that Jesus withdrew to the mountain to be with his Father to talk. 
with his five. And we know that later on the disciples went to the other side and Jesus walked on the water and so did Peter. Like the Apostle Philip, we often see life's situations with an earthly perspective instead of heavenly eyes. And there are so many situations in life that we are like Philip in this situation and, and can only see the impossibility of the situation. For example, if God told you, <laughs> quit your job, come out of retirement, move to Africa, I want you to be a missionary. Wouldn't your first thoughts be, God, financially that's impossible. Or maybe, come on God, I'm too old for that. You know, if that's our excuse, we need to read the story of Moses again. Moses, you're 80. I want you to go in and get my people free. I would have just said, God, I'm 80. Man, get some 40 year old. <laughs> or maybe if God told TCC to acquire land that's not for sale and build a $2 million church on that land when there's only 30 of us maybe attending. What would my first response be after you left? Thinking it was a joke? God, that's impossible. If God told you to lay hands on somebody with cancer and through his power heal them, wouldn't your first response be with skepticism? Wouldn't your first response be, well, that's kind of impossible. For most Christians, the natural laws of this world are so firmly implanted in our minds that we can't see the truth that God's power has no boundaries. And we say God can do anything, but do we really believe that? Yes. And then when he asks us to just trust him, well, I'm thinking a lot of us would think like Philip. And I'm not saying that Philip lacked faith that Jesus could perform another miracle so much as he lacked faith that through him, Jesus could perform a miracle. If we truly believe in Jesus' promise that we are his ambassadors, we are his royal priests, that we would, as he said, do greater things than these, then why are our visions and dreams of serving God in his kingdom not bigger? When it comes to sharing our faith, why are we so skeptical that we can re that we, we we that we can't reach the skeptics of the world? Even after we've been granted the ability to speak in the power of the Spirit. God knows where they itch. We don't. I've shared the story of Becky Pippert, whose roommate was a very intellectual and smart atheist. Becky would have conversations with her, arguments with her about why she should embrace Christ, and she destroyed Becky. And then finally one day she sat down with Becky and she said, how can I come to know Christ? Becky said that for the next hour I tried to talk her out of it because she was sick. <laughs> and she said basically she led herself to the Christ. She said, come on Becky, how can I do this step by step? And Becky led her to Christ. Years later she said to Becky, Becky, the reason I came to Christ was not because your arguments were good, they weren't. <laughs> it's what because you and I both made mistakes and you could easily admit them and say you're sorry and I couldn't and it haunted. And I found that the only difference is you had Jesus and I didn't. Amen. We don't know where people itch. God does. So don't think because a skeptic is an intellectual, you can't reach him. Because God's power can. And what about the visit from the Greeks in John chapter 11 with Philip? And I entitled this lesson, What? You want me to evangelize? In this passage, we're told that a certain group of Greeks amongst those, they came to, I don't know, worship at the festival, but they went up to Philip because he had a Greek name, and they asked him if they could have a little 
conversation, interview with Jesus. And while these Greeks, uh, a lot of people think that they were, uh, they were looking into Judaism. Um, they were newly uh, Jewish people because of their thinking. And they were, they were most likely a part of these Gentiles that they called God-fearers who were attracted to Judaism and the morality of it all and the, uh, the, the fact that there's a monotheistic God, in other words, one God, not many. And Philip probably was, at that point, overly concerned with met methods and protocols, and he, wouldn't, he wasn't sure how to deal with that um, or if he should take him to Jesus. Because they remembered in Matthew 10, Jesus said not to go the way of the Gentiles or Samaritans. In Matthew 15, it said, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So in his confusion, he sought out the advice of another disciple, Andrew. I always wondered why he went in. Um, Andrew was good at taking people to Jesus, right? And in the end, both of them went and told Jesus about the Greeks request. And while there's no mention in Scripture of whether or not the Greeks got their interview, we know that Jesus used that situation to turn and address a larger question that was handed to this huge crowd. How would salvation come about and who would get it? And Jesus tells the crowd about himself and the gospel of the good news. Now I wonder what would have happened if Philip had talked to them about Jesus at that point when they came and asked him. But he wasn't sure, so he went to Andrew, who knew the answer. Yeah, let's take him to Jesus. I wonder what would have happened if Philip took them right away. We're told in the Word of the importance of always being ready to tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ. And while we don't know if the Greeks got a chance to speak with Jesus directly or not, they probably weren't in the crowd when Jesus explained the gospel message for everyone. Peter tells us in chapter 1 Peter 3, 15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. We can't be like a Philip who sometimes thinks of uh, excuses not to speak of the truth concerning Christ. And it's, it's, let's face it, it is not that easy to stick out your neck and tell a skeptic about the path that they are living is leading them to hell. How do you say that in a nice way? That isn't the truth. That's what the Bible says. And besides, you know, sometimes we hesitate. We hesitate to talk to people like that about Jesus because we think it needs to be left to the professions. It's not always good for a friendship to confront your friend in what they don't believe. Let me leave that to the pastors. And I got to tell you, if you leave it to the pastors, a good portion of us have no clue either. We're just doing what we're telling you. We're trying to live our lives and share Christ with the people that we know how to share it with. And if we stumble, we might sound smarter than we are, but we don't know any better than you do. We all have a relationship with Christ. We're all ambassadors. That's what it says. All of us. And you know, I, I think a lot of times we're, we're, we struggle in sharing with a friend because they've seen us at our worst. And sometimes they see that what we speak and what we practice are not necessarily the same and there's a little hypocrisy that's there. So we feel a little hesitant to talk to them about Jesus. It's better. It's better if they hear and receive the message of Jesus from a stranger. And if that person's a speaker, well, the more polished speaker they are, the better. 
And interesting, again, in 1 Peter, it doesn't specify who should be prepared to share. It pointed to all those people who know and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Even if you don't have the gift of evangelism, be ready to share the gospel message when we're told over and over and over in Scripture that we're supposed to do it in different ways. We're told that the Spirit's going to lead you and He's going to give you the words to say. I love the example of Peter and James when the Sanhedrin says, stop talking about this man, Jesus. And they looked at them and they said, we don't care what you say. We can't stop talking about what we've seen and what we've experienced. My story. It's my story to tell. No one else can tell And lastly, in the upper room, we see Peter again in John chapter 14. And this lesson is, there is but one way. Final glimpse that Philip is in this upper room on the eve of Christ's crucifixion. And the disciples knew that their formal training was ending and that Jesus was, was soon going back to the God the Father in heaven. They didn't know exactly what that meant. They were a little confused. Uh, even though Jesus said in verses 1 and 2 uh, of John 14, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And, 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 and Thomas asked the question that all the disciples were thinking, and unfortunately he got labeled as doubting Thomas, right? And that's part of this from the thing from the truth, but we'll talk about that in later weeks. Uh, but he says, how can we know the way? How can we know the way, Jesus? And Jesus told them that he was the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Now to me, that's, that's kind of hard to misunderstand. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm the door. I'm the only door. Jesus was the way because he is the truth, i.e. the revelation of God. And because the life of God resides in him, Jesus was the only mediator and means of reconciliation between the sinner and God. He's the only door. And Philip responded by asking, asking for something for Jesus. And he said, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus responded by turning to Philip and asking him, Philip, how is it possible that you spent the last three years with me and the apostles, and yet you've not learned that the Father and I are the same? And Jesus then assured the apostles that his departure did not mean the ends of the works of God because they were... Uh, the, the fact that they were going to stand in his name, they were going to do above and beyond anything they can imagine and dream of, and God was doing going to do greater things through that. And, and, and understand, he said that anything you ask in the name of the Lord will be given to you. Understand that when Jesus said that, that was not meant as some special formula to pray where we say all the things we want or we think we need and then we say in Jesus' name. Yes, but do we believe that? We're asking for something in accordance with his will. Jesus promised to grant our request and continue to do miracles in and through our life in accordance with his will. And isn't that what Jesus said? Not my will, but your will be done. Mm -hmm. Ask anything in the name of Jesus Christ, but understand that his will supersedes ours. From this final passage, we learn that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. Living in this digital age where everyone is interconnected and proclaiming their own version of God and their own pathway to as the thief on the cross said, paradise. It's no wonder that so many people have given up on the idea of absolute truth concerning the fact that Jesus can be known, that they can have a personal relationship with them. Because let's face it, most people don't understand what that is when you explain it to them. 
Well, I have a personal relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a, they're, they're going to say, well, I have, a, I have a relationship with God too. But they don't get what that means. I don't care how smart they are, they don't understand what that means. If they need somebody to tell them. To reach the modern day skeptic who is fully entrenched in his or her own thinking, we have to, like Philip and Andrew, take them to Jesus. And for this to happen, the people of this world need to hear that there are not many paths to God, but only one. And that's hard to say. And it's not through their good deeds or tolerance of other people's beliefs that gets them to heaven, but their faith in the one risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Period. Those who know the way to heaven are responsible not for the salvation of other people, but merely to love Christ and be ready to give a reason of the hope that they have in Christ. That's what we're told to do. Be ready to give a response. Your job is not to win them to Christ. Your job is to tell them about Christ through your own experience, through your own story. That Christ died for everyone, that he offers salvation to anyone, and anyone who believes in him and asks them into the life will have eternal life, will have heaven, will have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the more we do that, the more we get people to understand this relationship, they become, as Amanda said, a seeker. And when you seek, you find. And we can't replace that because that is a motivation of its all, of its own. When someone's a seeker, you don't have to tell them to get into the Word. You don't have to tell them to talk about Jesus. When I was a new Christian, I didn't know enough not to talk about Jesus. My life was changed. My life was dramatically different. I was so excited that anybody that talked with me, they got an earful. And you know what? Some of them walked away from me. This is too heavy, Dave. I just walked up to the next person. I wasn't discouraged. I was so excited. I was living on cloud nine there. This was amazing. And I just wanted to share with everyone. I wasn't preaching. I was sharing my story. And no one could take that away. Well, Philip was a dramatic disciple. He was practically minded. And we see that in him. But also, he took, he took the very example of Andrew, I believe, and he decided to need to bring people to Jesus. And he took Nathaniel, and he brought many others. And he encourages us to do the same. And that's what the cross is really all about. We bring people to the cross, and we let the cross and Jesus Christ change them. So as we share communion, let's remember this guy, Philip. He's a good guy. He was an ordinary guy. He's an extraordinary guy.